You're listening to Now It's the News. I'm Beowulf Rocklin. We live in a nation where people work very hard and where the economy, although it is often touted as being very robust, while the numbers of jobs that are created are touted as as being very high, often those jobs are are the sort which necessitate the the working of three or four of them in order to uh, just get by. And while uh, stock market numbers are certainly going through the roof, that is not the case for the incomes and for the lives of millions of Americans. One story uh, that we're going to bring to you today is that of Stephanie Land. Uh, She is the author of Made, Hard Work, low pay, and a mother's will to survive. Stephanie, thank you for being with us today on Now It's the News. Thank you so much for having me. What is the background uh, to this story? You sought work as a maid, or or I should say it differently. That was the work that really was available uh, to you, given your circumstances. What were your circumstances, and, and what led you to be in this kind of employment? Uh, Well, it was the height of the recession. So, Mm -hmm. you know, 2008, 2009, and all of the jobs that I applied for um, were being filled by people who had been laid off and, you know, had even, you know, master's degrees and and loads Mm -hmm. of experience. And I had spent my 20s working customer service, uh, you know, doggy daycares and uh, coffee shop jobs. And had never had any problem finding a job. But suddenly now that I had this requirement where I had to work during daycare hours, um, it was incredibly hard to find an entry-level position. And the house cleaning was the only thing that I could find eventually. Right. And tell us about that requirement. I mean, you're referring to your uh, your daughter, Mia. Mm-hmm. Tell, tell us about you know what happened with you, her father and what the circumstances were and you know trying to make a living well i i think when you discover that you're going to have a baby you mm. want to be filled with as much hope as possible and i tried to be realistic and you know saw that i was older you know i was 28 i i wasn't mm. a teenager and didn't know anything about the world and how it works and so i I conferred with a lot of my uh, friends and relatives and, and they all kind of nodded and said it, it would be, it would be fine and we would all be fine. And by the time she was, uh, I'd say seven or eight months old, I was surprisingly in a situation where I could not fall back on my family for support. Uh, they just, they simply couldn't afford to support me. And her dad was incredibly angry and uh, showed that in in pretty harmful and abusive, emotionally abusive ways. Mm -hmm. And so we found ourselves living in a homeless shelter. We're speaking with Stephanie Land. She is the author of Maid, Hard Work, Low Pay, and A Mother's Will to Survive. What was that like living in a homeless shelter uh, with your daughter. Uh, it seems to me from, from having read the beginning of your book that you were shuffled at least once from one place to another in the middle of when you were trying to get back on your feet. I know that's often how the support systems through the government uh, exist. It seems tremendously frustrating to, to me, but, uh, but what was your journey through these different situations in terms of housing? I think... Uh housing insecurity is the biggest amount of stress that I have ever experienced. Uh, And I think that is a scary situation for people to imagine. Uh, Just, you know, not having a home. Like, where would you live if you can't crash on a friend's couch or you can't go stay with your family for a few days until you get back on your feet? Um, it's, It's really bewildering and and often um, it, it was it was like the feeling of being just shell shocked. Like I I was not really living in myself at that point. It was just um, 
having this extreme feeling of um, how in the world do I get, did I get here and how am I going to get out of this? Hmm. And not really having any answers. You described a situation in which you had to move out of the cabin that you were living in after 90 days. How on earth do you expect uh, a mother taking care of a, a, a little baby to get back on her feet with no other means of support after 90 days? I mean, how could you structure things that way? I mean, it, it's almost set up to fail. I mean, it, it really seems like there is something fundamentally wrong with the safety net that at this point we are providing for people who are in this situation and people seem to get into this situation an, an awful lot. I, I agree. And, and I think it's shocking that we still require work requirements, you know, 20 hours a week of work in order to get food. And you are not talking about a lot of food here. It's like a dollar plus per meal per person. Uh, I don't understand why we're forcing people to go to such great lengths to prove that they're fulfilling this this requirement just because we don't trust them. And and it's not like it's taking up a huge part of the budget. Like all of the safety net programs, you know, that's everything except Medicaid. So that includes um, child care, low income housing. That's only nine percent of our tax budget. And so yeah. it's really not that much money. But people act like it's this huge amount um, because they think people are purposefully not working in order to get this supplement. But what it's really doing is supplementing low wages. Right. What do you think it is? Because I have noticed that psychological phenomenon as well, where people are, you know, are paranoid almost about the idea of that that people who are poor should receive any sort of benefit because somehow they are likely to be uh, cheating the system. And yet we see enormous contractors through the government of one sort or another, you know, receiving enormous amounts in, in many cases, you know, thousands of times more than the small amount that people who are hungry receive and they won't think twice about it. In fact, they will become upset if you, say, well, we have to get rid of this because you are uh, attacking a quote-unquote job creator. How do you think people come to that mental state where there is such an imbalance in terms of support systems and how much money is placed towards them? I, uh, I just watched a documentary on HBO while I was on the road um, about Martin Luther King, and, and he, he said something – he said subsidies are acceptable, but welfare is, is you know, we're, it's a degrading position to be asking and for that. And we don't like to give it out because it's not acceptable. And I think it just goes back to this, um, this American myth that we're fed where if you work hard enough, then you'll make it in this country. And, and so if you're not making it, then you're not working hard enough. And so you've kind of brought it on yourself. Whereas people who are making it will will reward them for that and help them bigger, higher rateness. And hmm. it, it, it really is backwards to me. I, I think, you know, we like to create this narrative, uh, you know, that Reagan started with the welfare queen. And then we right. have um, this catchphrase of sitting on the couch eating bonbons all day. Um, right. I think we we have so many misconceptions and stigmas related to people in low class positions and, and in poverty and in systemic poverty. And a lot of those are, have racial undertones. A lot of them um, just, we have the assumption that they're uneducated and not able to budget financially. And when really it's just, I mean, how would they even know how to do that when they, don't have anything to budget for or budget with. Uh, right. Like I, I could talk all day about it. <laughs> I, I think that's like, I think that's the main thing is just we don't like giving people handouts, especially when we're telling ourselves that they put them in this, situ they put themselves in this situation because of bad decisions that they made. 
We're speaking with Stephanie Lynn. She's the author of Made, Hard Work, Low Pay, and A Mother's Will to Survive. You mentioned the concept of the welfare queen that came about during the Reagan administration. Given what you've been through, what, what, what's the reality of being on welfare in America? You're right. It's not sitting on a couch eating bonbons. What is it actually like, especially as a single mom, being on food stamps? I mean, what's the reality of living day to day? Well, I, I like to come up with an example that I used in the book of uh, I my caseworker for my child care grant called me and said, you handed in a handwritten pay stub uh, and that's not going to work. We need a real one or I'm going to immediately cut off your your benefit. And so that means I wouldn't have child care in order to work. Um, and I was on the phone like sobbing with this woman because how am I supposed to take time off work to go down to this office and wait for hours to get this pay stub that they think is acceptable and one that they believe me is real. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're caught up against that so much where, you know, you have a 50 cent raise and then you have a recertification for food stamps and suddenly you lose you know, a hundred dollars in, in your food benefit because of that raise. Um, you're constantly pushed up against this thing called the welfare cliff or the benefits mm-hmm. cliff. Um, and I think there, I read a study recently where a single mom making $10 an hour receiving government benefits like Medicaid, childcare, food assistance, um, in order to successfully jump off that welfare cliff, she would ha- her wages would have to increase to $33 an hour. Right. And when we're still fighting for 15, like how are we supposed to be expected to achieve that? We really need to begin shifting the whole way in which we think, because you're right, people are still saying, oh, $15 an hour is too much. Have you, have you tried to live on, on even that? It, 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 and it's getting worse every day because there is inflation. And, and, and you have to just have a different way of thinking about it. You, you have to be in the mindset of what is enough. And, and referring back to uh, your circumstances with, with the welfare office and you have, to get, you have to dot this I and cross this T, get everything just right, like y- the onus of everything is on you. It's a, a death by a thousand cuts sort of situation and and I, and and you have to go to each individual office because nothing is unified in this world is it there, there you have to go to a welfare office you have to go to a WIC office you have to go like like there's nothing consolidated so you're spending your time that you could be using to earn money it tracking down all these little administrative details it's it, it, it really it, you want to pull your hair out yeah and and it wasn't always like that when i first started you could go online or go down to the office and fill out one application, and that application mm-hmm. could qualify you for cash assistance, for SNAP, for child care, for Medicaid. And because you qualified for one or all of those things, then you were automatically enrolled in the free school lunch program or, you know, uh, utility assistance or anything like that. And they've been slowly changing that. Um, mm-hmm. I think just recently with the SNAP um, program, uh, reform through the farm bill. They were trying to take away the connection between qualifying for SNAP and qualifying for LIHEAP, which is the utility assistance program. And so you suddenly have to make two different appointments in, instead of just one. And it's two different packets. And it's you have to prove your need mm. and your um, work schedule twice. And I mean, even at the time that I was at, like 10 years ago, I carried around a folder of everything that I would possibly need, yeah. both to prove that I didn't have any assets and to prove that I was working, and because it seemed like I was constantly having to prove myself. We're speaking with Stephanie Lynn. She's the author of Made, Hard Work, Low Pay, and A Mother's Will to Survive. You've said a couple of different times that this happened at the height of the recession, and there's someone that would say, well, there are many more jobs now, and and the economy is better, and and perhaps to a degree that is true. What, what's your take on that? Do you think things have have changed? It, it seems to me, at any rate, that in some ways, especially what you described just now in terms of benefits, it's actually gotten worse. 
Well, I, I think there are probably more available jobs, but I think there's still entry level positions. And when you're starting over, especially if you have some kind of criminal record or um, you have a 